presentation on Publicness, Ritual, and Outdoor Cinema in Thailand is uh, by Richard and uh, He's a senior lecturer in Media and Communication uh, Department at Goldsmith University of London. He's the author of The Appreciation of Film, the Film Society Movement and Film Study in Britain. It's a study of uh, 16 millimeter projectors, film clubs, and making of film culture in Britain. In 2014, he was awarded a visiting fellowship from the British Academy and the ACF UK, if I'm saying that correctly, to research itinerant film projection and ritual practices of Southeast Asia. He's currently working on a British Academy funded project on mobile media practices in everyday life in Southeast Asia. Thanks very much, and thanks to the organizers of today's event um, for extending the invite to, to join you. I'm grateful to have this opportunity. Um, uh, this is where I cough nervously and say I'm not going to be talking about Italy, and I'm not going to be talking about cinema theatres, <laughs> and I'm not talking about memory. But I hope that the, uh, the thoughts that I'm going to share with you on this project on uh, outdoor cinema in Thailand will have some relevance. And they certainly resonate with um, this idea of the neighborhood cinema as uh, a class and public. So I think there's, a, there's some significant overlap there, which I think we can tease out. I do share the, um, the project's interest in understanding the place of the film uh, in everyday life. Uh, and on a much more modest scale, uh, I've used oral history and archival methods in previous research I've done that's looked at um, the film society movement in post-war Britain that's looked at city, city clubs um, over kind of roughly the same period, I guess, as the Italian cinema audiences project. Um, where the orientation of my research departs is that it, it detaches that interest in film and everyday life from the cinema theatre. Um, so it's it's not really I'm not really concerned with cinema going as such, in the sense of going to a cinema theatre. Uh, my interest is in the many other histories of cinema, um, many of them yet to be told, that happen outside of cinemas and outside of cinema theatres. So kind of improvised cinemas, um, the kinds of in improvised cinemas that cine clubs were engaged in and the kinds of improvised cinemas that I'll talk about today. Um, so I'm going to talk about some research I've been doing on outdoor cinema in urban and rural Thailand. Um, and this is outdoor cinema that is embedded in uh, a ritual economy, uh, which I'll come on to explain. Um, given the limited time, I'm mainly going to talk about um, a particular site, a shrine um, in the southern suburbs of um, Bangkok uh, called Tonburi. Um, it's just beyond the current reaches of the uh, metro system. Um, and I've been kind of researching this on and off for the last sort of 18 months, two years. I haven't had the luxury of uh, an extended film work period, so I've been doing it in these pragmatic chunks. Uh, I still think of it as kind of ethnographic uh, in its orientation. It has that kind of iterative process and the process of self-reflection. Uh, an adjustment as I've gone along. It's not been remotely like the um, Malinowskian model of this, the, the sole ethnographer. Um, I've had lots of friends accompany me along the way, some great photographers who can take better pictures than I, some people who speak uh, Northern Thai dialect better than I do, um, and so we've made a kind of large research team, a bit like the ethnographic model that Malinowski displaced when he went alone into the island. So I've kind of gone back to the older model of anthropology. I do think of this, um, or I situate this kind of project in relation to um, media ethnography and media anthropology more broadly. Um, I think media anthropology, I guess what I take from, from, from that is um, something that's said in the the, the beginning of that, the, collect, the seminal collection called Media Worlds that <coughs> um, really pushed forward the agenda of media anthropology. Um, that actually what the anthropology of media does is expand what counts uh, as media. Uh, so it takes us into new environments um, and it looks at diverse media practices as social practices in these new environments. 
Um, now, historically, what's tended to count in film and media studies is the key sites uh, where moving images are presented are cinema theatres and living rooms. That's, uh, and there's a kind of a split between film studies and kind of media studies and cultural studies around those two sites. Um, within film studies, the theatrical experience of cinema has been considered completely foundational, uh, and everything else is a sort of deviation. Um, and I think that legacy is still kind of with us uh, to some extent, although uh, the dispersion of screens and screen-based moving images um, is kind of uh, opening things up a little bit in the present. Um, but I'm kind of skeptical of this idea that cinema is only just relocated. It's always been kind of uh, dispersed, thoroughly dispersed. Um, so I see this research that I'm currently engaged in as kind of contributing to this um, uh, an endeavour of kind of fleshing out what a kind of screenology might look like. Um, so my interest is in the way the screenings I've been researching constitute um, temporary spatial interventions <coughs> in ephemeral urban environments. So it's looking at the way sc uh, screens uh, um, produce space, I guess, uh, but produce space in, in an ephemeral way outside of cinema theatres, uh, and do so in ways that actually exceed the intentions of those who initiate these, event, uh, these events. Uh, so I'll come on to talk about that and explain what I mean shortly. Um, one way to begin would be to briefly sketch two parallel and simultaneous uh, dynamics, geographical dynamics. One of concentration and the other of dispersion within the urban landscape of Bangkok. Um, what's become more concentrated geographically um, are commercial cinema exhibition venues. So concentrated geographically, but also in terms of um, ownership and market share. So by the late 90s, the standalone cinema theatre that was built in the 60s, 70s and 80s were more or less extinct. So multiple pressures, um, pirated distribution formats, but also um, Thailand's economic boom, which was um, resulting in spiraling land values, which were outstripping the modest box office takings of this kind of standalone cinema, um, uh, were, were kind of leading to their um, extinction, a kind of mass extinction, really, of this kind of cinema. Cinema going was being reconfigured um, there as elsewhere around um, uh, multiplex cinema screens located in urban centres and in middle income suburban shopping malls. And what that did was really consolidate the, um, uh, the connection, I guess, between film viewing and consumerism. Uh, attendance in these uh, multiplex uh, shopping mall uh, cinemas was probably three or four times more expensive than the neighbourhood standalone cinema. Um, so it appealed to exclusively to an affluent consumer. Um, recent trends really have kind of consolidated that extinction, if, if that's uh, an appropriate way, way to put it. But you've got um, continued infrastructure developments like the metro system um, continuing to kind of uh, lead to spiraling land values, which are kind of putting the one or two stragglers that did remain out of business. So it's kind of the end of this kind of cinema. So that's concentration within particular um, uh, ge geographies, um, consumer kind of late geographies. The dynamics of dispersion are of a different order. What's dispersed are the sites of spiritual practice. So the sacred geography of the city has kind of changed during a similar period. Um, the geography of institutionalized Thai Buddhism is focused, uh, focalized around temples and the practices and events that are associated with them, uh, some of which are sacred, some of which aren't. Um, throughout the 20th century, institutionalized Buddhism working through the Thai state has sought to purify and regulate and centralize um, a highly diverse landscape of vernacular spirituality that's been shaped by wave upon wave of migration, especially from China. 
Recent decades, though, have brought about a radical decentering of ritual practice. Um, so there's been an efflorescence of popular spiritual practices involving a highly diverse constellation of enchanted supernatural personages, uh, some of which draw on animistic <coughs> um, place spirits, spirits that are associated with particular places, uh, some, of, some of which draw on Chinese and Hindu deities, some of which draw on historical uh, royal personages. And these devotional practices and pilgrimages are directed at these figures, um, and they occur in public spaces, but not temples. So typically shrines. Um, so they're outside of the orthodox sacred localities. Um, these popular devotional practices have been dubbed prosperity religions to reflect the extent to which acquisition of wealth, acquisition of wealth is the object of devotional practice. So since the 1990s, uh, when Thailand experienced its uh, a kind of precarious economic boom, um, these prosperity religions have shifted from being a marginal um, feature of the spiritual landscape to being a dominant mode of religious expression. Um, practices such as pledging offerings to supernatural personages in return for bestowing the supernatural personage bestowing favours uh, on a business uh, or helping you pick the correct lottery numbers um, has become uh, a, a, a sort of everyday practice. Um, one beneficiary of the popularity of these transactional kinds of spiritual practices have been film projection businesses. Historically, um, supernatural personages have been pledged uh, things, objects that sometimes have symbolic value. People who want to be blessed with fertility will give eggs or for some reason bananas. But they've also often been pledged, um, uh, they've also been pledged live entertainment. So Chinese opera, uh, traditional forms of Thai dance and performance, um, and some popular shrines would have a resident dance troupe who could be contracted by the person who was wanting to engage the spirits in this kind of bargain, uh, negotiation, or pledge. Um, so they would have a dance troupe that, they could be, uh, that could be contracted. Other shrines provide access to the services of projectionists, and they provide a space in which to project a film. Shrines operate in quite a competitive spiritual marketplace. So the reputation and potency of particular spiritual personages kind of rises and falls. And shrines also look for ways to enhance the provision of their uh, devotional commodities. So the picture is one where cinema theatres have disappeared from the neighbourhoods of the subaltern majority of Bangkok. But improvised cinema continues to have a kind of impermanent existence as a devotional offering at diverse sacred sites. So what drives, what sets in motion the circulation of films across these sites is the desire on the part of individual devotees to fulfill a bargain with a supernatural figure. And it's, that's a kind of, a very kind of private transaction that they're entering into. They don't usually tell anybody else what the nature of the, the transaction, what it is they're looking for help uh, and intervention uh, around. But at the same time, the sacred locations where the pledges and offerings are made are publicly accessible spaces. Uh, and they're in busy urban locations where people come and go freely. Um, so they're open and they're accessible to the public. So there's a really interesting and curious tension between the privacy and the individuality of the initiating intention and the contingent possibilities of the screening uh, as a social event that happens as a result of it. Um, so they're inscribed in this site-specific devotional cinema, there's also a temporal lag, there's a kind of a, a temporal gap between the moment when you pledge, um, when you ask for something and you pledge something in return from, from the personage, from the supernatural being, and the moment when you fulfill the pledge, which could be a year later or two years later or uh, six months. And the person who enters into that bargain doesn't usually have to come, if they, um, uh, if they pledge a, a film screening to a being, 
who's associated with this shrine, they, they, a shrine, they don't usually have to be there present to see if it's happening. So there is this disconnect between the initiation of the, the event and the event itself. All of which points to the fact that the event of the screening itself is kind of semantically underdetermined. Um, so many of the images I'm going to show here are from a, uh, a shrine called the Tiger Shrine, um, a shrine to the, to the Tiger God on Petkisem Road in Tonbury. Um, and the background of this image shows the proximity of this shrine to this kind of, well, you can kind of just about see it, this never-ending process of infrastructural development, the extension of the metro system outside the city centre. Um, Film screenings here are routinized, but they're ephemeral spatial interventions. So they, they occur every night uh, from 6 o'clock to midnight. But the, for, the following morning, there's no sign at all that the, of the site's other life as an informal cinema um, for the shrine spirit. So there's no, there's no screen, there's no projection equipment. Uh, the space is a kind of vacant lot between buildings, which is used as a car park. Um, so this is an event initiated by devotees. It's mediated by um, shrine attendants. The nightly appearance of films at this shrine depends on the projectionist's regular interactions with wider distribution networks, um, which are both formal and informal, which facilitate the, the circulation of film as a material object, as well as a series of informal transactions that they enter into with police authorities. Um, so there are a series of bribes to various tiers of police within the hierarchy, uh, from neighbourhood police to the local superintendent, to enable them to, to um, fulfil um, the, the obligations of these devotees and screen films. So my main informants in this process are the projectionists. Um, they are vital components of this social infrastructure. They facilitate the projection of film within these improvised spaces such as shrines. The knowledge that they draw on combines technical, cultural, religious knowledge um, required for moving images to appear on screens within these sacred locations. And they've learned, really, uh, they've learned the difficult skill of changing reels on a single projector. So as I'm sure you know, most commercial exhibitors will switch from one projector to another. And they um, splice together the, the reels of film as it's going through the projector. Um, so the timing is quite extraordinary. Um, but they're also, in some sense, ritual functionaries. Um, they are the guarantors that the proprieties have been observed in, in these screenings. As I say, the host, the, um, the devotee who's initiated it, doesn't usually attend. They just trust that everything will be um, carried out and it should be. Um, this means, for example, that um, a show, a, a Chinese shrine here, and it, talking about things happening as they ought to, um, that usually means that before they show um, the main event, which can be anything, and is usually a kind of popular Hollywood film, um, what they do is show this uh, short introductory, introductory studio film. Um, of the eight Chinese uh, immortal gods coming down to earth that they are depicted kind of arriving through the skies and coming down to earth. And the projectionist explained that um, it would be considered very poor form if you didn't show that uh, film. Um, so just um, to start to wrap up, um, with some thoughts about the character of these shrine screenings as ephemeral but regular events that happen in public spaces. Um, as I say, they're, they're events that are kind of, in a sense, underdetermined by the spiritual intention that initiates it. Uh, I'm less interested in kind of appraising uh, what Francesco Cosetti talks about as the cinematicity of urban screen environments, such as this one. In other words, whether this is, uh, um, approximates an ideal of cinema formed within the theatrical tradition. It doesn't really interest me. I'm interested instead in notions of publicness here. Um, what I see when I observed these screenings 
And when I see, when I look at the photographs that document this site and others like it, and I reflect on these observations, is an assemblage of an environment, a technology, and a social practice of viewing that's actually as different as it's possible to be from the theatrical experience of cinema. In commercial cinema, in commercial theatrical venues, there's a threshold or boundary that's crossed that marks the point at which everyday, the everyday life world is left behind. A series of actions through space mark the passage across that threshold, buying a ticket, entering an auditorium, finding a seat. In this instance, uh, viewing space is continuous with the street. Pedestrians and bystanders become viewers and then move on. They move through the space. Space is continuous. Theatres, on the other hand, are bounded and discrete archaeological <coughs> spaces. They're bound by rules that separate them from the larger social and spatial context, in contrast to the open condition of public space here. In an interview with um, this projectionist, uh, let me see. Uh, Ron, uh, the projectionist at this shrine. He recalls a time when these nightly screenings would attract loyal crowds, large loyal crowds. Truck drivers would stop by on their way south out of the city. Shoe and garment workers from the neighboring factories would finish work at five and book a space. In an age of widely available pirated distribution formats, DVDs, VCDs, and downloads, the public that congregates within the space made by the screening now is a subaltern public of uh, street dwellers, street, dwell street traders and hawkers, laborers in the informal economy, fatic laborers like the motorcycle taxi drivers, uh, and prominently the homeless. So what I see happening here is not only a gathering to watch a film, but an ephemeral occupation of public space, legitimized by the screening, and occurring in the hospitable light that's thrown by the screen in the gaps between these buildings. The, so this got me thinking about the way public space is made by this ritual cinema. The way this space between the projector and the screen and the sonic space carved out by the speakers, all of which is premised on a show staged as part of a transaction with the spiritual realm, the way it draws these contingent publics of outsiders together. Um, I'm just, um, I don't know what sort of time I've got. Just, okay, I'll just briefly wrap up. I've been thinking about this in relation to different conceptions of public space and drawing on the geographer, the work of the geographer John, Don Mitchell, who says you can think about public space in three ways. There's, there are pub, there's public spaces that are designated by authorities, they're places that are designed and planned to be public. There are public spaces which hinge on public visibility, groups claiming their right to be in place and making their voices heard and their presence visible within it. So these are public spaces created in and through certain kinds of political struggle by disadvantaged groups. And then there are public spaces as uh, arenas of everyday life, spaces to relax, to sleep, to take care of bodily needs. And this kind of public space is especially important for the inadequately housed. There are spaces, um, a space to be and a space to, uh, to, to enter and dwell for people who lack private housing or people whose housing is uncomfortable or inadequate. Throughout Bangkok, those kinds of public spaces have been disappearing, partly because of some of the pressures that are squeezed out the economically marginal cinemas, uh, the neighborhood cinemas, but also because of the increasingly authoritarian political climate in which spaces of uncoerced um, and uncommodified social interaction are increasingly rare. And I guess just to finish on that, kind of put me in mind of something that Raymond Williams said about the consequences of the Enclosures Act. It's a bit of a leap, but. Um, so he said, when the pressure of the system is great and is increasing, it matters to find a breathing space, a fortunate distance from the immediate and visible controls. What was drastically reduced by enclosures was just such a breathing space, a marginal day-to-day -day independence for many thousands of people. 
and it's kind of the the, the, <coughs> the unintended construction of such a space through ritual practice, which uh, forms the focus of my research. Thanks. <coughs>